introduction and preface of the book of divine consolation of the blessed angela of foligno this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by anne boulet the book of divine consolation of the blessed angela of foligno translated by mary g stegman introduction what is the secret and so potent attraction of the saints renan says somewhere that he would have given everything he had to have seen saint mary of egypt pacing the desert in ecstasy half starved and turned to the semblance of nebuchadnezzar and renan liberally discounted the value not only of theology but also of the particular virtue the loss of which had driven that saint to such an unusual mode of life the interest in sanctity evidently survives theological and ethical preoccupations indeed to-day the saint is perhaps an object of higher intrinsic interest to unbelievers than to the faithful for to the faithful he is primarily useful either as being efficacious in various troubles of life or on a higher plane as a sort of spiritual agent obtaining graces for his clients o admirable commercium but like everything else this celestial intercourse suffers from the defects of its qualities i do not wish to be understood as making light of superstition the humblest blossom of that luxuriant garden is of infinite value nor do the roots of our most highly rationalized opinions grow outside it nevertheless the important position of the saint in the catholic economy does tend to conceal his real personality from his worshippers he inevitably tends to be considered more as a means to an end than as an object intrinsically worthy of contemplation in these circumstances the actual historical value of his personality is apt to be obscured by legend and fancy legend of course if at all contemporaneous is of the highest value as illustrating his effect on those with whom he came in contact we could ill spare in the life of st francis the wolf of gubbio modern devotional fancy is less illuminative it throws no light upon the character of st anthony of padua to learn that centuries after his death he recovered some papers lost by that devout man king charles the second what then is it that constitutes the intrinsic interest of the saint when his supernatural value has gone one reason i think for this interest is that the saint represents in a quite unique manner the satisfaction of a desire which all men more or less obscurely feel ever since man emerged from amid the labyrinth of irrational forces which until his appearance determined the evolution of life on the planet he has sought for power power at first over the hostile or indifferent nature which surrounded him over the stream the spark of fire the wild bear then over his fellow-men and at length when he began to turn his gaze inwards over himself it is noticeable that all the really primitive myths divinized various aspects of power celebrated the triumph of force as the social arts began to develop and among them of sheer necessity morality men began to attribute moral qualities to the force which they felt around them above them and within them n'ayant pas pu faire que le juste soit fort nous avons fait que le fort soit juste says pascal this attribution however no less than morality itself was an afterthought unconsciously conceived in the interest of his self-preservation for without morality of some sort man would soon have disappeared before the wolf and the bear and by giving the ultimate sanction of force to his social rule of thumb he naively betrayed his intuition that that ultimate force was the more fundamental reality now the saint represents the achievement of this longing for power carried to the highest and most difficult point that of complete self-mastery for a while to the primitive savage the conquest of external foes of one sort and another is evidently the most pressing need of his position a need recurring so constantly as to exhaust his store of energy and veil from his attention other possible achievements as life gets more secure and his attention is directed inwards 
man becomes aware of those other dangerous foes of his own household the appetites and caprices of his inherited brute nature turning to battle with these he dimly but surely perceives one aspect of the ideal of sainthood for the saints of all religions from the most elementary to the most highly developed are ascetics they live sparely and chastely and the mortification of the twin appetites of hunger and love represent to the ordinary man the acme of self-control the saint is also more than the ascetic asceticism is a refusal a limitation a constraint in a word a negation and the saint is eminently positive moreover although negative qualities might impose on the imagination and create interest they would not inspire the personal devotion that is invariably felt for him the positive quality of the saint is love expressing itself in joy thus he is a fascinating combination of the familiar and the unfamiliar for if few of us are ascetics we have most of us some experience of love but the saint drinks from the castilian spring of his interior life while we hand about the divinity to each other in treacherous and remarkably earthen vessels his love is not as ours at the mercy of circumstances it is not susceptible of betrayal or death for he has found his treasure beyond time and space where neither satiety nor caprice can corrupt nor can rivals break through and steal there have been all kinds of saints from saint paul the first hermit to father damien but the active saints seem less interesting than the contemplative certainly the fathers of the desert are very seductive they live in caves or on the tops of pillars supporting their existences on roots and brackish water while they exhale their souls in a hymn of timeless ecstasy like shelley's skylark solitude was to them as water to fish and they prefer the society of beasts to that of men st paul had his attendant lions and st anthony abbot spent twenty years in a tomb with serpents who turned into evil spirits by night and in these unusual circumstances became one of the most important personalities of his generation the external conditions of their existence were often grotesque almost always terrible their inner spirit was the most precious thing humanity possesses for when everything else has failed a man he arrives if his courage holds out at the joys of the spirit the forces manifested in his experience which succeeded in the long run in eluding his dominating grasp answer submissively to the call of his mind in contemplation like fabled adam naming the docile beasts he sits in their midst assigning to each its post and due perspective in the panorama of life for he has arrived if without the help of metaphysical analysis by experience at the conviction that nothing is real but thought which is the first and perhaps the last word of philosophy mystics and contemplatives of east and west of all creeds and rites have borne substantial witness to this truth this is no doubt the reason why alike to the popular imagination as in the treatises of theologians the contemplative life is extolled at the expense of active virtue for to all of us there come moments when we are aware of a psychological need more profound more urgent than the desire of action before certain works of art or occasional aspects of nature or it may be at the exquisite climax of some mood of intimate personal emotion a delicious paralysis steals over the will we feel that we have done enough in the calm that follows the whirlwind and earthquake of volition now it seems definitely stilled we are conscious only of the beauty of the situation on which we gaze we have no desire to modify it we only wish to gaze on for ever the aesthetic sense has entirely replaced ethical striving blessed angela of foligno was a true daughter of this ancient line born in twelve forty eight she entered the family of st francis as a tertiary hermit and became through the spiritual autobiography which she dedicated to her confessor fra arnaldo one of its most striking illustrations st francis and his knights of the round table seem from the first to have struck a new note in medieval religion the monastic order whether benedictine or cistercian wrapped in the aloofness of its splendid cloisters frequently governed by abbots who were great feudal lords 
represented it may be said the aristocratic principle in spirituality the aims of the monks were lofty unintelligible no doubt to the villains of the soil who were their dependents they fed and educated their humble neighbors but their own life remained exclusive a thing apart saint francis brought the spiritual life down to the people the popolo minuto and he did so here was his splendid originality without lowering the values of what he brought within their reach the religious democracy that he created remained an aristocracy of the soul his logic was amazing because so simple in most men thought and action move on different planes with them action implies at least some degree of compromise but when saint francis stripping himself of his father's cloak and flying naked to the bishop's arms proclaimed the divine royalty of poverty that most unusual phenomenon was seen a man's thought and action in perfect harmony something of that divine simplicity of that exquisite unison of thought and will is what constitutes the franciscan spirit distinguishing all his authentic children and not the least of them the simple woman who unfolds her wonderful experience in this small volume we know little of her life born within thirty years of st francis's death she entered on the life of penance after a youth spent in moral disorder she lived in solitude with a religious companion in the neighborhood of the church of the friars minor at foligno until the year of her death in thirteen o nine her visions which are of the most touching and beautiful description appear to have been all of the kind described by mystical theologians as intellectual that is to say they were unaccompanied by any sensible manifestations some of them indeed as she notes herself occurred during sleep they are an extraordinary blend of naive candor and passion they indicate with an accuracy which i feel tempted to ascribe at times to the editing of the possibly more analytical fra arnaldo the moments of what may be called the diametrical process of sanctification the point of departure of her conversion was a purely self-regarding dread of the penalties of sin the contemplative mood of the love of god to which she ultimately attained absorbed all the intervening emotional categories this little book may in fact be called in the hegelian sense of the term the logic of sanctity it is certainly one of the most important documents we have of medieval psychology and illustrates in a very remarkable manner the completeness of that system of mysticism which was at once the root and blossom of the medieval intellect only in angela the intellect is hidden under a succession of emotional moments which develop by their own spontaneous dialect out of the whole mood of which each of them is the passing but necessary expression that mysticism is the finest and on the whole perhaps the sanest there has ever been it is far from being exclusively christian deriving from the lecture halls of alexandria as well as from the hills of galilee it has come down to us through a series of great experimentalists who have furnished to those of like mind with themselves its justification in their own experience it is the classic catholic mysticism as the roman church has always understood and still understands the term few systems of thought have swayed the imagination more profoundly remaining a true mysticism by nature of its goal the beatific vision it has succeeded in incorporating in itself the ethical aspirations of western energy it thus mediates between the passive ecstasy of hindu pantheism and the restless volitional activity of the white race the dogma of the incarnation has here been of the greatest service the unknown and unknowable all is contemplated by the catholic saint in the person of christ the dogma gives him a lens with which he can focus the rays of divinity and unite them in a shaft of light on which he can gaze without faltering in this way he is provided with an inexhaustible object adequate to his mind and will on the one hand he can never know the tragedy of satiety for although he may faint with fatigue his object is inexhaustible and on the other his will is not ruled out as an illusion but fortified by the prospect of an infinite perspective of effort and achievement for catholic mysticism may perhaps be best summed up in the phrase by which a great philosopher of our day has described life itself as a creative evolution 
the acts of virtue of faith hope and charity of a saint are not waste of time or merely negative use they do not merely serve the purpose of withdrawing him from temptation they actually constitute the spiritual life within him like the words of consecration in the mass they create in his heart the divinity which they assert the mystic gradually passes beyond this mood into that profound and eternal rest of the soul which theologians call the beatific vision and which is according to the teaching of aquinas enjoyed by some still in life with an even greater intensity than by others who literally sleep in the lord the roman church has ever regarded catholic mysticism as the kernel of the depositum fidei of which she is the guardian it was for it she fought throughout the long and wearisome controversies which brought to the birth at nicaea the orthodox dogma of the incarnation for as has been said without that dogma catholic mysticism would have missed its specific and characteristic note and would have become a mere variant of neoplatonist theurgy the inherent tendency that all mysticism has to pantheism indeed to nihilism would have inevitably asserted itself nothing short of faith in the descent of the infinite into the finite could have saved the wavering lines of human personality turned inwards to gaze upon itself all including that personality would have become an unstable illusion the web of maya woven by the fallacious dreams of human desire and european religion at least at the point of its highest individual development would have been indistinguishable from buddhism when schopenhauer drew his parallel between catholic and buddhist mysticism he failed to see the enormous difference made by belief in the dogma of the man god it is perhaps not without significance that he dwells so much on the value in that connection of madame guillon whose quietist tendencies resting ultimately on a docetic view of the incarnation were the cause of her difficulties with bossuet at first sight perhaps the visions of the blessed angela may seem to have only an archaic value to us the world in which she lived seems so remote from ours the circumstances of her life so different from anything that could possibly occur to us that her experience seems hopelessly irrelevant to our own needs but this is a superficial view the human heart has always been the same there exists a law of what may be called sentimental constancy and nothing that has ever been believed by any one is without value it is enough if the faith and the experience were really genuine angela is an authentic specimen of a clearly defined class of human beings mystics are very rare but they exist moreover they are only rare in the west oriental bazaars are crowded with them they prophesy at the corners of streets surrounded by yellow dogs picturesquely clad disciples and occasional european tourists quite a considerable number of human beings pass their lives in a state of more or less constant inspiration we are apt to forget this and limit the possibilities of all experience to our own it is therefore enlarging to our minds to step sometimes into other people's worlds in the world of blessed angela we shall find much to interest and astonish us and perhaps to excite our admiration we shall at all events enjoy the commerce of a pure and candid soul the translation here offered to the reader is that of the first italian version which was made in fifteen ten from the latin of fra arnaldo this version is one of the rarest books in the world and has a special value as being one of the earliest popular devotional works printed in the vernacular in italy it takes its place with the dialogo of saint catherine of siena and the fioretti of saint francis among the attempts to popularize mysticism which represented a too little known side of that complex movement which we call the renaissance preface by the old italian translator unto all readers beloved in jesus christ although in the holy gospel our most loving lord hath plentifully shown unto us the means and the way whereby we may attain unto the perfection of christian life yet hath his consoling spirit giver of all comforting and spiritual grace nevertheless not ceased nor ever will cease to reveal unto us continually by means of his most worthy instruments the which are saints and devout persons 
divers ways and conditions of finding the most perfect and consummate union possible unto wayfarers in this life and although by the facility of printing there hath been put forth an infinite number of books so many that they do obscure the sun of justice upon earth seeing that there are more evil books than good because by reason of their perverse judgment and voluptuous desires men do delight more in imagining and in hearkening unto hurtful things rather than unto wholesome ones and because through the world's abuses evil men are more favored than are good men yet cannot malice overcome wisdom neither can the many overcome the few for this reason also hath god elected the weak to confound the strong and thus in our own times hath he inspired many women of exalted spirit and they did lead most holy and exemplary lives walking upon the short and straight road amongst these is the blessed angela of foligno who although a woman and therefore of the weaker sex did nevertheless by means of her humble patient and steadfast despising of the things of this world and by her chosen and beloved poverty overcome all the strong and powerful of her time unto whomsoever shall truly read and prudently consider them her conversion penance temptation and doctrine as set forth in this book will be of exceeding profit for walking in the way and service of god until he attaineth unto the happiness of glory this book hath already been printed in latin divided into three treatises namely of penance of visions and of doctrine but because it was neither elegant nor learned in that language it was neither read by scholars nor understood by the simple and for this reason hath it been deemed well to translate it into the vulgar tongue that it may be universally understood and be profitable unto a greater number of persons the writer hath not sought to put it into elegant language nor yet into the tuscan or the courtly tongue but only to render it intelligible wherefore each one is exhorted to read it solely for his profit and for the good of his soul which he will the more obtain the more he doth carefully read and digest and put into practice that which he hath read and digested for it is not the readers but the doers of good works who attain unto grace and although it is to be believed that the writers of that time put down everything in the order in which it pleased god to recall it unto the memory of the blessed angela yet hath it seemed more convenient in this translation into the vulgar tongue to put the treatise of doctrine into the second place the which in latin is given the third place and to put here as third treatise that of the visions and consolations which in latin hath the second place this hath been done because these consolations and visions are things most high and it hath seemed right to leave them unto the last to be read by those who are more perfected and instructed and first to set down her teaching which is likewise that of jesus christ as being more universally profitable and especially unto beginners the treatise of doctrine is further divided into several chapters which was not done previously in order that it may be more easy and less wearisome unto the reader because certain of the chapters were exceedingly long each one is now prayed and exhorted that for his own good he weary not of reading this most excellent book wherein he will find pointed out that straight high road the road of poverty of pain and of contempt whereby it is easy to find god and from which none can excuse themselves as they might do from the contemplation of the incomprehensible trinity and it will be unto him a joy to hear and know of those sufferings and other ills which christ and the saints did willingly endure for our sakes piously praying god that he will open the treasures of his mercy unto all amen end of introduction and preface